Hi, this is Steve Andres. I'm the pastor of New City Church, and this is our podcast. Every week at New City, we invite people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and learn how to make a difference. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I hope that this message inspires and challenges you to love God and serve your city more. If you want more info on New City Church or other resources, go to newcity.life today. But for now, enjoy this message. I've been enjoying this series that we're calling Homecoming because it stirs something up in me preparing for and, and getting, getting ready for each weekend that we are here together. And one of the reasons, I believe, is because home for every one of us is such, in it, that, that word alone has such power. It has such weight in our lives. For some people, it brings about great memories. For other people, uh, it, it, it brings about some difficult memories. But when we, when we talk about home, we're not just talking about the place where we grew up. We're talking about the places and the times that we felt most loved, most accepted, most purposeful, you name it. And so that isn't always just in our homes where we grew up with family. Sometimes it has to do with friends that we've been with. Sometimes it has to do with seasons of our lives where we felt connected and a part of something. We felt very much at home. And so when we talk about home, that's really what we're getting at. There was a German philosopher who I will rarely quote to you, but his name is Martin Heidegger, and his whole idea of the essence of being human was summed up in a word that he called unheimlich, which had to do with not being at home. Being human was the feeling of not being at home, is what he said. And a very interesting, you know, kind of approach for somebody who I wouldn't consider to be a believer, but who would, was, was basically saying, our common experience is you and I longing for home. And so I just thought about it like this. How many of us spend time, even during pandemic, comforting, comforting ourselves with the memory of that season that we think of as home? Could have been childhood, could have been college, could have been, you know, being a part of a team where we felt so connected to people. And whenever we need comfort, we go back to those feelings of home. And this is what is so amazing about I think what Jesus is telling us, the story that Jesus is telling us in Luke chapter 15 is he comes back to this idea again of what it means for you and I to have a home. The whole Bible is pointing toward this. From Eden, when Adam and Eve were alienated from their creator and from their father, and when they became wanderers, the Bible says that they were away from home. And all throughout the Old Testament, there is this sense of longing for home and even the promise and the hope of a homecoming. In Isaiah 55, the prophet talks about this, this feast that God is preparing sometime in the future where he's laying out. It says, you know, come all you, anybody who wants to come. There's bread, there's honey, there's milk. There's, there's, there's a bountiful feast. We think of Thanksgiving like a, a, just a spread for everybody who would come. And you don't have to buy it. You don't have to be able to pay for it. You're just welcomed in. That's the hope of the Old Testament. And then Jesus arrives on the scene. And he begins to have these curious gatherings, these meals with sinners and with people who you wouldn't expect him to hang out with. And all the while that he's doing this, inviting people in and, and spending time with them and, and literally feasting with them, people are kind of getting upset. And they're asking him, why in the world are you, are you hanging out with this crowd of people? And in response to this, he tells three stories in Luke chapter 15. And those are the stories that we've been talking about in this series. And the first story is one about a, a sheep that gets lost and a shepherd that looks for it. And the second story is about a coin, a, a precious coin that gets lost and a woman who is searching for it until she finds it. And then the third story is about a family. And here's, there, here's where we can really connect because we, we get, instantly we get a glimpse into a home and into a family that is dissolving right in front of us right? Unfortunately, that's, a, that's an experience that, that so many of us can relate to. But here I want to read it to you, and I want you to listen in, and I want you to kind of just kind of jump into the story as I read it to you today in the way that Jesus told it from Luke chapter 15. It says, Jesus said to them, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there, he wasted all his money 
in wild living. About the time that his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am, dying of hunger. I'm going to go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. And so the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back he was told. And your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry, and he wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you, and you never once do a single thing, and and you never once refuse to do a single thing that you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back, after squandering your money on prostitutes, you you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost but now is found. Let's pray together. Father, thank you today for this beautiful story. Thank you today for what it tells us about who you are, for what it speaks to us about who we are. I pray, God, that you would help us, uh, Lord, to see clearly today. Let your Holy Spirit illuminate this word to our hearts. Shine a light on it so we can see it clearly and so that we can identify how we can apply it to our lives. That when we're finished here, Lord, when we're finished in this time, that we be different for having received your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Now, I know that I've made mention of this before, this being one of my favorite stories probably of all time. I really do believe it. It ranks up there as one of the great short stories ever told, ever recorded at any time and anywhere. I love it because it says so much to me about me. Jesse and I were talking last night uh, briefly about what I was going to share today, and she was asking me about it, and she said, you know, do you, love this, do you love this story so much because you see yourself as the younger son? Because I had a season in my life where I was, you know, just a little, little wild, and, uh, and before I came to Christ, and, and certainly I, I, that, that's true. I said, you know what, I see myself in both of these people. I, I sometimes could see myself as the younger son, like Thomas here. I'm just kidding, Thomas. But I could see myself as the younger son. I could see myself as the older son sometimes, right? And so last week I talked about it. I, I, I spent time walking through the story, focusing on the younger son. This week I want to talk about the older son. Because even though in your Bible it might have a little heading that says the, the parable of the prodigal son, it was Jesus who started out the story and said a man had two sons. And I'm going to tell you about both of them. <laughs> Because they're both lost. And that's literally what we want to talk about today. Because as we walk through the interaction that the father had with his older son, we see a lostness there that really Jesus' point is that we have two sons who need saving here. The first thing that the, that the, uh, that the older son says to his dad that, I really, that jumps out at me is he says, All of these years, dad, all of these years, I've slaved for you. And he uses that word. It's intense that he uses that word because this is the bottom line. He's saying, I live at home, but I feel like a slave. 
I live at home, but I'm, I, I, what, what he's really saying is, I don't actually have a connection with you, Dad. I'm actually here trying to do this because out of obligation, right? When the younger son stopped trusting his dad, he wanted that inheritance. He didn't trust his dad to, to deal justly or fairly with him, and so he demanded his inheritance before his dad died. And in order, you know, in order to get control, he said, I want to have, I want to get control of this so I can live this wild life. And he ended up, right, he ended up in this distant country being a slave in that distant country. But the older son, I want you to watch me here, the older son tried to get control of his dad through his obedience, He basically says, hey, Dad, you owe me because I have always done what you've asked me to do. His obedience, he was trying to control his father through rigid obedience. And in the end, he felt like a slave even though he was at home. Right? The older brother, I want to tell you, we could say, some people are like, well, he was really good, but he was lost too. No, he wasn't lost in spite of his goodness. He was lost because of his goodness. Because he actually relied on his goodness and believed that his goodness put his father in his debt. His goodness gave him leverage to control his dad. That was the way he saw it. And let me just tell you, there are so many people who live their lives like this with their conception of their father in heaven being such that I, if I just live a rigidly, if I live a good life, if I'm just able to do what God wants me to do, if I can just, we see it, I see it all the time. Ask anybody on the street, what do you think? Do you think you're going to go to heaven? They might say, well, you know, whatever heaven is, I think I'm going there. Why? You know why? Well, it's because I'm a basically good person. That's what they're going to say. And what they're saying is, I'm living a life like this older son, where my goodness puts God in my debt. He des- I deserve this. And this is the problem. Jesus is saying, the older son wasn't lost in spite of his goodness. It was his goodness who made him lost, that made him lost. He said, I've never disobeyed you, Dad. And that's the problem, is that he was alienated from his father while he was in his own home. See, so many people grow up like this. They think, well, I grew up in church, and I grew up knowing what I, need, what I, what I know, and I'm just trying to be a good person, just trying to make it by, just trying to you know, make, be good enough to get into heaven. And this is the thing I want to I tell you today. Don't, be careful that, you might not, that you're not lost because of your goodness, because the thought somehow that you could put God in your debt, and this is exposed in our lives whenever we go through experiences like right now in pandemic where we say, God, how could you do this to me, Right? Or where we experience some tragedy or some hardship in our lives and we say, God, well, you know, I don't deserve this. I, I thought I did all this for you. I haven't even disobeyed you. Why? I've been through my own seasons like that. Where I was tempted to ask God, is this, is this how you treat your children? But the bottom line is this. There are two ways to be lost, according to Jesus. One, by being very bad, like the younger son. But the other way of getting lost it's by being very good like the older son. He says, I slave for you. I, 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 he was alienated from his father even while he was obeying him. The next thing that really gives us insight that the older brother says is he says, when this son of yours, right? He says, I've always obeyed you, but then when this son of yours, and you can imagine at this moment that the, that the older brother is pointing toward the house where the, younger, where the younger brother is, where the younger son is, saying, when this son of yours, and then he describes, he goes through the list of things that this son had done. And he doesn't call him when my brother, he says, when your son. And you see how he's creating distance between him and his father. You see how he's pointing the finger. And let me just tell you, religious people are always angry about something. Older brothers are always angry about something because deep down, deep down, they really aren't satisfied with the way the father, the decisions the father is making, right? They aren't satisfied with how God is running things. They look down on other people, and they always are pointing the finger just like the older brother says. And this is what he says to his dad. He doesn't even address him appropriately. He uses a very common term, not one that's respectful. He says, look, you That'd be a great way to say it. Look, you, let me just talk to you, right? This son of yours, right? I'm the faithful one. And here's what he's doing. He's, notice how quick he is to point the finger. He's almost saying, how dare you act like that? How dare you make this decision, Dad? Because I've worked for you nonstop. And while, while, while this son of yours was out there living it up, I was right here holding it down. 
and he's offended. He's angry. And he's looking down, not just on his younger brother, but catch this here. He's actually looking down on his dad. He's actually judging his father. And that's the, that's the ultimate here, is he's insulting his father, not even addressing him the way he should. But he says, look, you, I'm not even going to go into the party like you want me to. And I want you to see this because some of you, when you get this root of bitterness inside of you, when you experience this woundedness or this offense from somebody else, his, his brother offends him. But watch what happens here. In the end, instead of just pointing the finger at his brother, he points the finger at his dad. An unforgiving spirit, I want you to see this, an unforgiving spirit will eventually find fault with God. If you aren't careful and you persist in unforgiveness toward somebody in your life and you feel like justice just is not served, I, you know, what happens is every time we feel like that, justice is not served, that unforgiving spirit is ultimately going to end up judging God for allowing the injustice. And that's what the older brother does. He felt he was mistreated. He felt he was a victim in this scenario. And that's where the danger is. Because grudge-bearing, watch me, grudge-bearing and victimhood creates a feeling of superiority in us. Just just follow me here. Because when you've experienced it already, when somebody does you wrong and you know that they were wrong, all of a sudden you feel like you're standing on the moral high ground. Oh, I'm better than you. How dare you do that? I, you know what? You know, it creates this feeling of superiority, and we want to lord that over whoever did the wrong, right? And we say something like this, I would, ne- whatever you, I would never do that, right? How could you? I would never do that. The problem is, even though you might never do that, you might do something that they might never do, <laughs> Right? You know, that, that idea somehow that we're better than that wrongdoer is, is actually part of, the, part of the root of the problem in us. The danger of unforgiveness and developing that sense of superiority is that we feel better than those other people. But let me ask you a question. Are you really better than them? You see, gospel forgiveness is rooted in the understanding that I'm not really better than somebody else. I, it, it, gospel forgiveness produces, it comes from a humility in me that says, you know what, I recognize that I am sinful just like them. When we see leaders who fail in the church or in our country or in our community or even in our own homes, when we see people do that, when, when that happens, it's so easy to kind of to kind of puff up and say, you know, I, I would never do that. But the bottom line is when we are thinking, reflecting, and living in the gospel, what we realize is, oh, they have feet of clay just like I have feet of clay. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't consequences for failure. It just means that we don't strike that posture of superiority in that moment. Because when you and I have that pride inside of us, it, it basically it, it, it gives space for unforgiveness in our lives. The gospel destroys my sense of superiority, right? It destroys my record of wrongs that I want to keep of other people. That, that unforgiveness that wants to kind of, kind of write in permanent marker, permanent ink, what that person did to you. Let me just tell you, the gospel basically wipes that away because we realize we've been forgiven of so much we have no business holding it against somebody else. Miroslav Volf, who's a, a scholar but who grew up in, in communist Eastern Europe, wrote some wonderful books, uh, Exclusion and Embrace, the end, of, the end of Memory was another one that was really wonderful. But one of the things that he says that is this. He says, the difference between justice and forgiveness is, is that to be just is to condemn the fault and because of the fault, to condemn the doer as well. But to forgive is to condemn the fault, but to spare the doer. And that's what a forgiving God does. You see, God doesn't just go with justice. He moves past that to forgiveness, condemns the fault, but spares the doer of the fault. This is what the older brother is doing. He's pointing at his brother, and he's saying, this son of yours, and then he lists his faults. But thank God the Bible says that our heavenly Father does not treat us as our sins deserve. He doesn't keep a record of wrongs for us. But the Bible says as far as east is from west, that's how far he's removed our transgressions from us. So think about how our Father is. Because that's what the father said, says to his son. After, after the older brother just kind of rattles all this stuff off, it says this, number three, dear son, everything I have is yours. And I, I love it because in the original language, 
This thing that gets translated here as dear son could also be, it's, it's a term of a great tenderness. It's like saying my child, right? And even though this is a grown man that he's dealing with, it's just like me. When, when, I, uh, when my mom, who always she unfailingly reser- uh, re- refers to me as Stephen, you know, like it's never just, she, I don't think she's ever called me Steve in my life. Um, Stephen, whenever she talks to me and, you know, if she's really tender, she gives me a kiss and hugs me and I haven't seen her for a long time. Says, oh, Stephen, it's so great to see you. You know, all of a sudden I go from being a grown man to being, you know, 10 years old again, right? And here's what the father is doing. He's, he says, my child. And I love how he's tender toward his son, treats him with such tenderness because he knows that he's lost as well. Think about it here. The father has literally liquidated his wealth. He's had to sell everything in order to give the younger son his third that was coming to him because the older son would have had a double portion. The younger son would have had a total of about a third of the estate, right? So that means that whatever remained, the two-thirds that remained of what the father originally had, it all belongs to the son. It's literal what the father is saying. Everything I have actually now belongs to you. Everything I have is yours. And so think about that. The older son is wealthy at this moment, but in spite of all that, he's not focused on the father's goodness or his generosity. He's literally bothered by the fact that we're spending money on this stuff here. I want to challenge you today, even in a season like this, even in this moment where we may look at our, at our circumstances and say, man, I, I wish that this were different and I wish that this were different. Don't fall into that trap of focusing on what you don't have. The antidote for you today in your life for whatever you're going through is to be grateful for everything that you have, to rejoice and to give thanks for the generosity of your heavenly Father for giving you breath today and every other good thing that has come to your life. And so here's what I want to say today. Do not focus on what you want. Focus on what you can work. And what I mean by that is this. If you've been blessed with a blessing, then you need to start working that blessing. Don't focus on what you don't have. Start working what you do have. Right? Don't focus on what you want. Focus on what you can work. If you've been gifted in in a certain way, work that gift. That's what we do in in Growth Track. We say, hey, listen, here's who we are as a church. We want you to be a part of this. We want to find out where you've been gifted, how you can contribute, and then we want you to work that gift. And even in pandemic, we got people going through Growth Track, figuring out ways that we can have you serve the people of God and serve outside in the community. We want you to work that gift. The Apostle Paul, there's a passage where he talks about it like this. He talks about I, he, Paul, the Apostle Paul says, I will boast in my weaknesses because in my weakness, God's strength is shown all that much more clearly. So the Apostle Paul would literally say, you can work your weakness for the glory of God. <laughs> Even in this moment in pandemic, it's possible to give thanks for what you are up against because you get to see God's faithfulness in it. And I will tell you, there have been dark seasons in my life. There have been difficult times in my life. There have been times where I haven't known what's going to happen next. And I am so grateful for those times because in those moments of weakness, I got to see God's faithfulness. Do you know today, if you will just give thanks, you can work your weakness. You can work your gift. You can work your blessing. Whatever it is, don't focus on what you want. Focus on what you can work. 2 Peter 1 says this, His divine power has given us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. His divine power has given us everything. And now, I did this. I went back and I used some of those Greek study tools that I have and in my limited knowledge of Greek that makes me dangerous. And I'm looking at that word for everything. And I want to, I even remember what it is because it's actually one of those basic Greek words. It's panta. And and so I I remember, you know, you look at what that word means and you kind of dive deep into it. You know, it's translated as everything, but what does it really mean? And here's what I found out. It means everything. (laughs) It means everything. His divine power has given you everything you need during this season. Do you believe that God is able to provide whatever you need today? That's what the Father is saying to His Son. Listen, Son, don't worry. Everything I have is yours. And if our Heavenly Father could speak to us today, and He is, He would say this, everything that you need, I have a supply of. And if you need it, I'm going to get it to you. Believe that today. Whatever he has is yours to use. And then the father says this, your brother was lost, but now he's found. 
And I, this might seem obvious to you guys, but I love what this says because it, 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 isn't, it isn't trying to gloss over or deny the fact that the younger brother messed up. That's a remedy that a lot of people want to go. They say, you know what? Let's just not talk about it. Let's, not, let's, let's go ahead and say nothing is wrong. <laughs> let's go ahead and say nothing is bad. Everything's okay. And that's not what the Bible is doing here. It's saying that we're going to speak truthfully about what happened here. Your, your, younger, your younger brother, he is lost. But here's what it's also going to do. It's going to take truth and it's going to add grace to it. But now he's been found. Because if you have truth alone, you just get an instrument that will clobber people. <laughs> Right? And if you have grace alone with no truth, you basically have anything goes kind of permissiveness, and there's no life in that. But what we see here, what the Bible is doing all throughout the New Testament, is it's actually saying we're going to speak with truth and with grace. That's why John said that about Jesus, that he was full of grace and truth. And here he is, Jesus, demonstrating that to us again. Two stories that start out in Luke 15. The first one is about that sheep that gets lost, and then the shepherd goes out searching for it. The second story is about a woman who lo loses this precious coin, and so she searches for it until she finds it. But then Jesus tells this story, and it's about this son who is lost. But you know what's missing? Is there's nobody who goes out searching for him. It had to be somewhat striking. What they expected maybe in that culture was that the older brother who was in charge of the estate, who was in charge of the family business, who was in charge of all that would have been that keeping the family together as they went on to the next generation, it should have been the older brother who went out searching, but he didn't. And you can imagine that Jesus is glaring at the Pharisees as he's talking about this story, saying, you got a problem with all these sinners, but don't you know is your job to search them out. The true older brother would have left the father to go to that distant land to find that younger brother and to bring him back. And when he came back, he would have actually been the one who carried him into the feast. He would have been the one that would have brought him into that celebration. He would have been the one. But it's missing from this story. Jesus says, that's what I'm doing. That's why I'm hanging out with these sinners, because I'm bringing them into the feast. And I want you to see this today. When we talk about that unforgiving spirit, the Bible is so clear. Forgiveness always takes the initiative. Forgiveness always moves toward the need. Forgiveness always takes the initiative. Matthew 18, Jesus says this. He says, if you have a brother who's at, who's at fault, go and seek him out and talk to him about where he did wrong to you. And then in Matthew 5, if you remember, it says that if you did somebody wrong and you remember that, that they have ought against you, that's the, that's the version I remember. It's an old-fashioned way of saying they got beef with you. If somebody has beef with you, leave your gift at the altar and go find them. And here's what it's really saying. It says whether you are the one at fault or whether the other person is the one who wronged you, it's always your move. It's always your move. Because forgiveness always takes the initiative. So then the father says this. Well, we had to celebrate. We had to celebrate. There's only one right way to respond to this, to this younger brother, this brother of yours who was lost but now is found, who was dead but is now alive. He says we've got to celebrate. But you know what the older brother is thinking in this moment, right? Right? The older brother is looking at all that's gone on and this expensive, lavish feast to kill the fattened calf. Man, that was a costly thing. That didn't happen but once a year, if that at all. Meat was a luxury in that, in that time. And this particular fattened calf would have been reserved for the most special of occasions. And he's looking at this and he's saying, you know what, Dad? Who is paying for that party? And if you think about it like this, if he owns everything that remains of his father's wealth, the cost is really to the older brother. The younger son came home shoeless, dressed in rags, 
But at the end of the story, he enters the feast robed with sandals and the family ring back on his finger. Do you know that that's our story as well? Some people over the years have have pointed at this story that Jesus tells and they've said, you know what? See, Jesus really didn't know about atonement. He really wasn't talking about any sacrifice because the father just lets this, lets this younger son in. There's no cost there. There was no sacrifice that had to be made, but that's wrong. Because you know who had to pay the price for the party? The older brother. The older brother had to pay the price. And the Bible says there is going to come a day. Isaiah 55 was looking forward, forward to it. Jesus was pointing to it with these curious meals with sinners like this. And the book of Revelation actually points to that say, that day when there will be a feast like no other, when you and I, sinners just like you and me, are going to be welcomed to a feast like no one has ever seen, where all of those moments of homeness that we long for and that, we're just, that we thought were just those, those moments that we love the most, but they were actually pointing towards something even greater, the moment when we actually come home to the place where we are accepted and loved and purposed like we have like no way we've ever experienced before that is the future that you and I have the presence of God when we'll be home and it's only possible because of Jesus our older brother Jesus I, I read there's a there's a passage in Hebrews where it talks about our elder brother Jesus and I remember reading that as a new Christian and thinking well that is the weirdest thing I've ever read before but if you read it in light of this story it makes great sense because I don't know how the conversation went exactly, but I imagine when God the Father looked down at a lost world, wondering, what are we going to do to bring these lost ones home? It was our older brother Jesus who said, Dad, I know what my, I know what my job is. Send me. It doesn't matter what the cost is, and the Bible says that he left, that, that, he, that being in very nature God, he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, and he took on the form of a servant so that you and I could be brought, brought back home and made sons and daughters of the living God. Think about that. You and I get welcomed to the family of God because Jesus on the cross was alienated from his heavenly Father. You and I can be given rights as sons and daughters because Jesus made himself a slave. You and I can be clothed in God's grace because Jesus was stripped naked and humiliated on the cross so that you and I can be clothed. Oh, the grace and the mercy of God that would bring us in and invite us to the feast of God. But think about this today. The sacrifice for this feast was not a fattened calf. It was a spotless lamb. And that's why in Revelation it talks about the marriage supper, the, the, the feast of the Lamb, because that's you and I coming home. Jesus sought you and me out. And if you're here today listening, watching, whatever it might be, and you recognize that you are not, it could be that you've been going to church your whole life, but you recognize you're alienated from the Father because your life in church has been about obeying so that you can put God in your debt. Let me, let me just bust that up today and say, you and I have nothing that is good enough to put God in our debt. Let me bust that up today and say there is nothing that you and I, the Bible says that our righteousness is like filthy rags before God. And so if you're if you recognize today, I'm shoeless, dressed in rags, nothing, nothing that, that should give me a right to be called a son or a daughter of God. But Jesus sought you out and loves you in such a way that he wants to bring you in today. Let me tell you today, if you will receive that grace today, that's all that's left to be done. The elder son, the elder brother has come your way and reached you where you are today. And he wants to bring you into the feast. And all you need to do is say yes. If that's you, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And I want you to, to receive God's grace today. And know that when you receive that grace, you can be different on the inside. Your status in heaven goes from lost one to found, from dead to now alive, just because of the grace of God. You repeat after me as I pray it, and I want you to make it your prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, 
and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to. You rose from the grave to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with my heavenly Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be made new. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, amen.